too quiet for Tanisan. The Garden of Harmony was one of the most enchanting yet secluded hot springs in the whole of Japan. Very few people knew of it. Built on the site of an ancient Shinto shrine, it could only be accessed by a single road that wound its way up through the lonely mountains. A verdant haven amongst the beaches, it was crisscrossed by a network of rickety wooden buildings with pointed roofs, narrow pathways, mossy alcoves and shady verandas. A bamboo watercourse fed two stone baths in which guests could luxuriate while savouring the tranquil atmosphere. This, coupled with the breathtaking views, made it the perfect retreat for those seeking oneness with nature. In short, it was difficult to imagine a more idyllic spot. Mm, I don't like it, said Tanisan, casting a wary eye at these surroundings. There's something fishy about this place. At the time, she was immersed up to her neck in warm, soupy mineral water, while just across from her, on the other side of the pool, sat her dim friend, Mrs Ishihama, similarly submerged. They were like two basking snow monkeys. Well, I think it's lovely, said the latter, as she leant back against the rocks to enjoy the early morning sunshine. Tanisan paused in her reflections to peer through the steam at her. Yes, well, you're not exactly known for your scintillating insights, are you, Ishihama-san, she said. You thought that a metronome was a gnome that lives in the city. Well, I just don't see what the problem is, said Mrs Ish, with a shrug of her shoulders. What is it that bothers you so? I can't quite put my finger on it, said Tanisan, her eyes darting watchfully from side to side. But one way or another, I mean to find out. Even at the best of times, Tanisan was not a massive fan of hot springs, or onsens as they're rightly known. She'd only agreed to accompany her three friends because their original plan had been to spend just a short time there after visiting a town in the area, which was known for its popoyaki and chocolate cake. The problem was that when they'd come to leave, they'd been told by the old couple who ran the place that there'd been a landslide further down the mountain, which meant that it was impossible for the minivan that had brought them there to pick them up until the road had been cleared. So they'd ended up staying the night at the behest of the owners, who'd been only too eager to compensate them for the inconvenience. Now, for most people, a free overnight stay and complimentary dinner at a luxurious onsen would have been a piece of good fortune, but not for Tanisan. She did not do peace and harmony, and had found the experience quite taxing. The evening meal had been nothing short of perfect, the accommodation sumptuous, and on the one occasion she'd had cause to complain about the rattle on her sliding door, it had been quickly and efficiently dealt with. All in all, it had been a thoroughly unsettling affair. Don't you think that you're overreacting slightly, said Mrs Ishihama, keen to put Tanisan's mind at rest. Mrs Sekiguchi said that coming here was one of the best decisions we've ever made. Yes, said Tanisan, clearly unimpressed. Would this be the same, Mrs Sekiguchi, who said that it would probably be OK for you to give some of your chocolate cake to that blind lady's guide dog? If so, I have serious doubts about her judgment. Where is she, by the way? Still at the animal hospital, I imagine, said Mrs Ish, unless some kind person has been good enough to take her home. No, 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 said Tanisan. Mrs Sekiguchi. Mrs Ishihama leant forward and adjusted her bath towel which had started to slip. I've no idea, she said. I haven't seen hide and a hair of her since we all parted company last night. Having said that, I did overhear her talking to Mrs Terracado about trying out some of the special skin treatments that they do here. Hmm, mused Tanisan. Don't you find that strange? Well, said Mrs Ish, when you're born with a face like Mrs Sekiguchi's, you have to be prepared to try anything. Point taken, said Tanisan, although that's not what I meant. Don't you find it strange that they should just disappear like that without telling us? Not really, came her silly sidekick's reply. I'm quite used to people not telling me things. And even when they do, I'm usually none the wiser. That's probably why they don't bother. And quite frankly, who could blame them? Yes, said Tanisan. Well, being none the wiser does tend to be your forte, doesn't it, Ishihama-san? I suppose that what I'm trying to say is that we may not be able to trust the people here. I mean, even you, with your feeble powers of deduction, must have picked up on the fact that they're being just a little too friendly and accommodating. That meal they put on for us last night was enough to feed ten people. It's almost as if they're fattening us up for something. Tanisan stopped short, 
for just then she spotted Mrs Yamanaka, the owner, making her way towards them. She was carrying a tray and had a big, friendly smile on her face. "'Good morning, ladies. I do hope you slept well,' she beamed as she bent down to hand each of them a wooden cup. "'I just thought you might like to try some of our special homemade kelp and beech twig tea, which is not only invigorating, but very good for you.' Tanizan sniffed the brackish brew. "'Good for someone,' she muttered distrustfully. Mrs Ishihama took a little sip of hers, pulled a face, and then placed her cup on the edge of the pool. Uh, Mrs Yamanaka, she began before Tanisan could stop her, I'm glad you're here because you can settle something for us. Uh, speaking for the group, I think I can safely say that we've been overwhelmed by your kindness and generosity, but Mrs Tanny here doesn't seem to think that we can trust you. Quick as a flash, Tanisan reached out underwater and grabbed Mrs Ish by the ankle, pulling it towards her. As a result, her loose-lipped companion slid straight down and disappeared beneath the surface of the water, cut off mid-sentence, as it were. The weather, said Tanisan. I don't think we can trust the weather. Any idea when the road will be clear? Mrs Yamanaka frowned, her gaze alternating between Tanisan and the gently undulating ripples where Mrs Ishihama had been only moments before. Oh, uh, later this morning, hopefully, she replied. Uh, are you sure she's all right? Oh, yes, said Tanisan, still holding on to the ankle. She sometimes likes to take a little dip to brush away the cobwebs. Ah, oh, look, here she comes now. So saying, she let go of the leg and Mrs Ishihama came coughing and spluttering to the surface. Yes, yes, that was most refreshing, wasn't it, said Tanisan, patting her on the back. And I think that what both of us would really like to know, Mrs Yamanaka, is whether you've seen our two travelling companions this morning. Isn't that so, Ishihama-san? Ugh, cried Mrs Ish, still gasping and rubbing her eyes. It's gone up my nose. Mrs Yamanaka tilted her head to one side and thought about it for a moment. Uh, no, she replied. I can't say that I have, although I wouldn't worry too much if I were you. They can't have wandered far. I see, concluded Tanisan. So what you're saying is that there's no escape? Oh, well, no, I don't think I'd quite put it like that, said the old lady, a little disconcerted by Tanisan's attitude. All I meant was that it's, it's such a small place that they're bound to turn up sooner or later. Yes, of course, said Tanisan. I'm sure they will. Dead or alive. This last remark caused Mrs Yamanaka some concern. Well, I, I'm rather banking on the latter, she said, not at all certain where this was leading. After all, it, it wouldn't do our reputation as one of Niigata's foremost health spas any good at all if every guest that came here had to be carried out in a wooden box. Uh, no, uh, we tend to find that we get more return business if customers are liable to survive the experience, uh, at the very least. For some reason, Mrs Yamanaka could not understand. The conversation had taken a dark turn. So in the hope of establishing some sort of rapport, she tried to change the subject and lighten the mood. Oh, uh, by the way, she remarked airily, my daughter and I were just talking about you. She's very keen to know what your secret is. At this, Tanisan suddenly sat up straight. What secret? She snapped. I haven't got any secrets. What do you mean by that? Has she been going through my things? I beg your pardon? That's it, isn't it? said Tanisan. She's having a good poke about in my room while you keep me talking. Oh, no, no, nothing like that, said Mrs Y, startled at Tanisan's reaction. We just thought that you have lovely skin. Oh, said Tanisan, clearly alarmed. What a peculiar thing to say. What would you want my skin for? No, 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 poor Mrs Yamanaka tried to explain. We didn't say that we wanted it. Good! said Tanisan, pulling her bath towel closer around her. Because you can't have it. It's mine. I'm using it. Having finally realised that it was pointless trying to communicate with this person, Mrs Yamanaka just stood there staring at Tanisan, while Tanisan stared right back. Yes, said Mrs Y, after a very awkward silence. Well, uh, I suppose I'd better be getting on. Those beds won't make themselves. Once she'd started along the path to the chalets, Tanisan turned to Mrs Ishihama, who had now recovered from her undignified dunking. You see, she hissed, they're definitely up to something. By cleverly applying various psychological techniques, I was able to wheedle it out of her. Oh, said Mrs Ishihama, was that what you were doing? Of course, said Tanisan, with scant regard for the facts. 
It was all part of my plan. And now that I have her on the run, I intend to squeeze and squeeze her until the whole truth comes oozing out. Oh, yuck, said a revolted Mrs. Ish. So that's why detectives have to wear those special gloves. The next part of Tanis Anne's so-called plan was to establish whether they were being lied to as regards the closure of the road. So once they'd left the pool and got dressed, Tanis Anne told Mrs. Ish to wait in her room in case their friends turned up while she was gone. In the meantime, she took a walk down to the gate at the entrance to the onsen. There was no sign of activity in the immediate area, so she carried on down the mountain to where the access road took a sharp left turn. Down below in the valley, the autumnal foothills were a shimmering mass of orange and gold, implausibly suspended on a fine white mist that hung above the orchards and paddy fields. Yes, it was all very suspicious. Now completely convinced that the story about the landslide had simply been a ruse to keep them there, Tanisan hurried back up the road to Mrs Ishihama's chalet. But when she pulled back the sliding door, her simple-minded confidant was nowhere to be seen. And this led her to one inescapable conclusion. They were being picked off one by one. With no time to lose, Tanisan headed back to her own chalet to collect her things. Possessed as she was of a highly attuned sense of self-preservation. However, on her way there, she happened to spot something small and shiny lying on the stepping stone next to the water wheel. And the consulting detective in her couldn't resist the urge to investigate. She wandered over and picked it up. Much to her surprise, it was one of the little silver question mark earrings that she'd given Mrs Ishihama for her 50th birthday. Tanisan slipped it into her pocket and looked about. It was then she noticed that the stepping stones led to a path which disappeared amongst the beech trees. Now enthralled to her own curiosity, she followed it into the woods, continuing on until she came to a stone lantern. To one side of that, there were some crooked steps leading to a grove. Tanisan climbed them to the very top, but then quickly ducked down and hid amongst the bushes. From her rather restricted vantage point, she was able to make out Mrs Yamanaka's daughter digging in a glade next to three large earthenware pots. On seeing these receptacles for the first time, Tanisan couldn't help but stifle a little gasp of horror, for poking out of the tops of them were the heads of her three friends, Mrs Ishihama, Mrs Terracado and Mrs Sekiguchi. They appeared to be submerged in some sort of sludge, great dollops of which had oozed out over the sides. Tanisan watched in utter astonishment as the younger Yamanaka shoveled some more of this muck into a bucket, carried it over to Mrs Ishihama's pot and emptied it out around her head, smoothing it down with her hands. She then disappeared from Tanisan's field of vision, only to reappear a few moments later with three dome-shaped lids with holes in the bottoms, whereupon she went from one pot to another, placing a lid over the head of each lady. These lids acted as chimneys, causing the steam that rose up from the sludge to funnel upwards through the holes and out into the atmosphere. Like a child who for the first time sees her mother wearing a cosmetic face mask, Tanisan felt that special fear that occurs when the familiar world suddenly changes into something strange and frightening. And in her panic, she ran. Meanwhile, at the other end of the onsen, a silver-grey minivan turned the corner and pulled up on the gravel by the gate. A thin man with a long, lugubrious face climbed out and went round to the passenger door. He slid it back and stood aside with a sort of weary forbearance as one by one a variety of small middle-aged women climbed out, forming a noisy gaggle at the side of the road. In spite of the fact that he'd been their tour guide for the last five days, they were only vaguely aware of his existence. Uh, ladies, ladies, he said, raising his hands, can I just have your attention, please? Come now, ladies, a little hush if you'd be so kind. Please, ladies, I'm begging you. Or will you just pipe down and listen to me for a second? Silence! At this, there was a deathly hush, and every one of his unruly charges turned to look at him. Thank you, he said, albeit with a definite air of reproach. Welcome to the Garden of Harmony, Nigata's most exclusive spa bath, renowned for its charming watercourse and the rejuvenating effects of its volcanic mud treatments. 
While here, you will be able to enjoy a selection of fine foods while relaxing in a tranquil setting. Favoured by feudal lords and intellectuals alike, it was founded almost a thousand years ago on the Shinto principle of harmonious coexistence with nature. All at once, there was a loud disturbance in the bushes off to the left. Tanisan came tearing out through the undergrowth, wild-eyed and with her hair sticking out in all directions. For a moment, she just stood in the middle of the road, peering frantically from left to right, as if she wasn't quite sure where she was. But then she caught sight of the new arrivals and came rushing over to them. Get out, she warned. Get out of here while you still can. They want to turn us into compost and steal our skins. I suppose she must have thought that the tour guide was in on the conspiracy. For the next thing she did was to grab handful after handful of small stones and launch them in his direction. Then, as if to underscore her displeasure, she marched up and blew a raspberry at him, before scuttling off in the opposite direction. The group of ladies who had witnessed this incident then looked to their guide for some clue as to what it meant. So he stopped flinching and brushed off his jacket. Oh, uh, well, yes, of course, he remarked in a half-hearted attempt to make light of the situation. Having said that, it's, uh, it's not for everyone. <laughs>